are listening to the 411 Foresight Wrestling Podcast on the one and only 411 Podcasting Network. You know who I am. This is Justin Watcher. I am going to be riding solo this week. Our good friend Steve is in California, so we are wishing him well for the next few days and hope he comes back in one piece and we can get back going on this thing and make everybody love us even more than they already do. I think everybody knows what we're going to talk about today. We got a little CM Punk news that we're going to get to in just a little bit. But before we do that, I will remind all of you that you are listening to the 411 Foresight Wrestling Podcast on the one and only 411 Podcasting Network, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, YouTube, and of course, 411mania.com. You know all about that. Our 411 maniacs love it all. So how about I just stop all the stalling and let's just get to it, folks. So here's the deal. CM Punk. I know we talk about him a million times, and we're going to talk about him even more, so get ready. Let me just get a few names out of the way right here. Bruno Sammartino never would return to WWE. Never. Never in a million years. We know all the issues with that, the Vince McMahon story, the whole back stuff. Everybody knows about it. He returned a few years ago, WWE Hall of Fame. We know all about that. The Ultimate Warrior, same deal. Everybody knows about it. All the different ups and downs and everything through their history, the self-destruction, all that great DVD, everything. He returned. Do I need to even mention Medusa and everything with Alundra Blaze, the title in the trash can, WCW, Monday Night Wars. Again, she returned, WWE Hall of Fame. Brock Lesnar, he went on ESPN, just ripped them a new one, just bashed the company, everything. When he exited, he would never return. There's no reason for him to come back. He had zero to prove anything. He came back and has been with the company now for, what, six, seven, seven and a half years, something like that. Good old JR, how many times has he been fired? How many times has he been gone? How many times have they had their ups and downs and... Guess what, folks? He came back a million times. He's in AEW right now, and guess what? I have no doubt at some point he'll be back again. Roddy Piper, same thing, HBO, the special, everything with WCW, never would return. Well, he came back many, many, many times, WWE Hall of Famer, and a whole bunch of appearances since then. Brett the Hitman Hart. I mean, is there anything I need to add to the Brett the Hitman Hart story? I'm sure all of you already know about it, but guess what? He came back, and not only did he come back, shake hands with Vince McMahon and work on a DVD together, he got inducted into the WWE Hall of Fame, and he even worked a match against Vince McMahon. I mean, it was WrestleMania 26, Phoenix, Arizona, I believe. I mean, it was just one of those never-say-never moments. But he came back, and not only that, but he even won the United States Championship. I mean, that's how crazy this world can get. So Bret Hart came back. Sable, multi-million dollar lawsuit. All the different things that were said about her. All the different things said about the company. Guess what? She returned, not even, what, two, three years later, she was back, and guess what? Making out with Vince McMahon on worldwide television. So again, folks, we're going to run down a few more names here. Hulk Hogan, Hall, Nash, I could go on and on and name even more. They all said they never returned. They all had very bad things to say about the company. But at the end of the day, they came back. So let's just get right to it. CM Punk is the latest you can add to that list because while he is not officially back, we've been talking about it for months, especially me in column form. If you haven't been reading them, if you haven't been listening to this podcast, perhaps you should start because we've been talking about it. I've been telling you the little insight and little things that have been going on. But we got a little update on it. So uh, basically the Wrestling Observer, I know everybody has their feelings about that and we all have them about the source. But uh, here's the deal, folks. Um, WWE is basically the place where he can make the most money. I'm just kind of reading off what the Observer is saying here. Um, He is going to be 41 years old next month, I believe in October sometime. And he is, uh, you know... Not exactly doing a whole heck of a lot. The UFC thing I think is done. I talked about that while he was training. I know I've talked about this before. I had somebody that actually was training at the same facility with him. So while all this was going on, I had a little update on how he was doing and how his fights would go. And, well, they went about exactly how he figured, and that's how they went. And I do not think he'll be back. I would be completely shocked if he signed on for another fight, especially in the UFC octagon. But there's not a whole lot he can do. The comic book stuff, that's great. The acting, I mean, you know, wherever he goes with that, not exactly the big roles he's probably been hoping for. But if he's having fun, he's having fun. And uh, just a few weeks ago at StarCast, he, uh, you know, he made a few comments about, hey, you know, it's water under the bridge. You know, it's kind of like, I don't know if he would call first or they would call first, but hey, if WWE wants to talk, they can talk. And I don't know if it was reported at the time already, but... um, You know, they already had been talking. The whole Fox, the WWE backstage show that has just been announced, I think it's for FS1 Tuesday nights 
Um, there had already been some discussions, so this actually isn't even really news or any kind of a new update, but it's already been kind of going on, and if they can get him on the show, I would instantly watch, all respect to, uh, you know, Renee Young and Booker T, they have their pros and cons like all of us do, but I don't feel I need to tune in at uh, 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock on a Tuesday night to listen to those two talk about WWE. I'm sorry, I love them both, but I don't feel the need to watch each week, and I think ratings would reflect that after a while. There kind of needs to be a little bit more pizzazz, and Renee Young and Booker T, as much as they uh, are highly respected in their regard, it's not going to do it. I'm sorry, it's just not. So CM Punk was apparently uh, mentioned in this article here about how some people believe he wants to return. Now, I'm not going to say he doesn't want to return, but I'm not going to also say he doesn't not want to return. Does any of that make sense? No, it doesn't. But the thing is, it goes back to the part where it's, hey, you'll listen to an offer. You know, he's not banging down their door saying, please let me in, please let me in. I want to return. I want to return. That's not what this is. So everybody that's thinking that they can cross that off right now. But at the same time, like I just mentioned, he's uh, he's listening. And if uh, him or his agent or Fox or WWE or whoever is uh, you know wanting to chat with them, he'll listen. He'll be right there talking to him. It's nothing. He's gonna immediately shut the door on and say, "Oh, block that number." You know, I don't want to even hear from him. It's not that at all. And PW Insider won up that news with the report that. CM Punk was actually in L.A. He was actually uh, doing a little uh, test run, as they say, or a little audition. I don't even know if it would be an audition, but a little camera work for the Fox Sports studio show, the WWE backstage show with uh, Renee Young and Booker T. Um, the story from PW Insider notes that Renee Young was present there, and they were both kind of, you know, tested. They were kind of tested for the on-camera, kind of like see how the, you know, how it goes. Uh, I can't think of the right word right now, but the chemistry and, you know, how it would be. And the story notes that he has not been signed for the show at the time. That is true. He has not been signed. And I'm not even saying he will be signed. I'm not saying that at all, but this is yet another step in that direction, which, again, we've been talking about for months, and the seeds have been planted a million times that it's very possible. And, you know, the other people were brought in for this, so don't just think that this is a CM Punk vehicle and, you know, he's the only person in this role and the whole show is created for him and all this stuff. That's not true at all. Uh, the story notes Taz was there, Paige, Mysterio, Sean Waltman, other people that have not been uh, reported yet. Uh, we'll be waiting for that. But a few other people uh, were also brought in, you know, so this isn't just a CM Punk or bust kind of show. I don't think that's what WWE is going for. Obviously, they're always going to have their bases covered in some form or fashion. But the big news, of course, is all about CM Punk and you know, basically getting a deal done. And I have a few little things written down here about this besides what we've already been talking about for weeks, folks. Again, if you haven't been listening to this podcast, this is going to be news to you. But a lot of this is repeated stuff that we've been saying that this is absolutely positive. And this goes back to my 411mania.com column from January where all indications I got and I wrote it and I've been writing since is he is ready to return. He is uh, eyeing up something and I don't know whether it is WWE or AEW, but um, I've been saying for the past few weeks that it is WWE over AEW. Everyone was talking about All Out, the Chicago connection, all that stuff with StarCast, and that very well could have happened if Tony Khan would have opened up his billions of pockets a little bit more. But um, it has always been a WWE favored over AEW, and like I said, I got a few things written down right here, so let me just mention real quick uh, the Paul Heyman connection. It does not take a genius to figure out that those two are close. I have no doubt those two have been talking. I have no doubt that CM Punk is well aware that Paul Heyman has basically been given the reins here to run a little bit of a Raw. Uh, Vince McMahon, as he has mentioned, is not going to be in the foxhole for all of this. Vince McMahon, however old he is, I'm afraid to even Google it right now, but you know he's got the XFL thing going on, and he's not going to retire. He's not going to leave WWE permanently. He's never going to be gone completely. 
but he's brought in a bunch of his guys and a bunch of his former friends or current friends, however you want to phrase it, to kind of bring back. We already know about Bischoff and Heyman and Bruce Pritchard, and he's kind of had his guys that he's trusted for years, and they're kind of back in the fold here. And then you know about Triple H with NXT, and he has his guys. So Vince can kind of step away. He's got the billions. We have no doubt about that. He has the millions of dollars to blow. We already know about that. He's got the spending. He's got the funding. And now he's got the XFL thing going on. And as much as he probably wants this Fox launch to go great with SmackDown Live, if he has the people he trusts there and he can be at home and he can do whatever he can do with the XFL meetings, then he's going to do it. And if Paul Heyman is there and kind of running the show or at least has a stronger voice now, you don't think he's mentioning the name CM Punk? You don't think he's at least talking with them or Fox and the whole agent connection from a few weeks ago. You don't think there's more to that. You know, you got to be kidding yourself. And it was a no doubter when Heyman was running things and suddenly Brock Lesnar appeared and he was money in the bank and back as universal champion. It was no shock at all. And now look what's about to happen with SmackDown. Brock Lesnar again, Kofi Kingston. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But again, folks, all this is adding up and all of it does add up to more and more CM Punk, whether you love him or not. And next I have written down here, AEW over, I'm sorry, WWE over AEW. Um, I don't know about you, but to me, this would be a big, big, big blow. I have no doubt in my mind AEW has been targeting CM Punk for weeks, if not months. You could even argue years. I know that goes back before AEW. But they've been talking about this for a while, and the big fish out there outside of the legends like Stone Cold, The Rock, and all those guys, um, the bigger name has been CM Punk. Like I said, he's going to be 41, I believe, and you know he is still current. He can still be active in the business, unlike you know Stone Cold and Rock or even Undertaker, somebody where you know, you're know you not sure how much time you're going to get out of them or how much he can do in the ring and all that. But CM Punk still absolutely can do it. And I think this would just be a big blow to them right before their premiere next Wednesday. I think it would be huge, huge, huge. It would speak a lot that of all the backstory with CM Punk and the lawsuit and the huge, huge, huge lawsuit that they went through with the doctor and the scathing remarks he made on the podcast with Colt Cabana. We all know about that four or five years ago. And then for him to return instead of going with the elite group and going with this revolution or movement or whatever they're trying to spin it as on TNT, Turner. I think it would be a big blow to them, whether it reflects in the ratings or not. It would just speak volumes that, you know, somewhere along the line, somebody bungled something with the negotiations. We know they've talked, but to not land a deal and whether it's money related, which has been talked about, we will uh, get to that when more details come out. But the uh, the money situation, Tony Khan's got the billions, and if they made some sort of ridiculous low offer or something that was just like insulting or even the whole thing about how somebody texted them an offer, I don't know if that's even true, but that seems a little BS to me that you know someone would even text an offer. That's not how you do things. I mean, I don't know if it would actually matter to their show because they do seem to have a full lineup and a full roster over on the All Elite Wrestling uh, Dynamite show, which I don't actually like that name, but it makes sense with the TNT connection, you know, TNT Dynamite. Yeah, real funny. Um, I think, though, for WWE then to come in and take CM Punk, it'd be like, wow. Wow, what does that say about them? What does that say about their ability? What does that say about them as quote-unquote executives, which you can laugh and mock all you want? But, you know, I think they had to land CM Punk. They have to still land that big name. We all love Jericho and his bubbly and all that good stuff. But I don't think that's going to get it done. They, they still need that splash. They still need that Lex Luger moment. And unless this is building up to something and CM Punk walks out on their show next Wednesday, I would say this is a major blunder on their part. But to kind of go back full circle here, um, we're kind of waiting here. I'm kind of recording this and kind of hoping that some news breaks, but I don't think it will anytime soon because this is all kind of in development right now. This is all kind of just testing out, as I mentioned, the uh, chemistry stuff with uh, Renee Young, seeing how they would do so. This isn't actually anything that will probably break uh, imminently, so it's kind of all developing still. But uh, to me, this is big news any way you want to slice it, because just like we've seen with Warrior and Sting and different guys, once you kind of get in the fold, you know, you do get that itch to get back in the ring. You do kind of go, well... You know, this is fun and all, but, you know, I can make a million 
doing this match and this sounds like fun and here's this guy I want to work with and this guy and if I train a few months or whatever and get back into in ring shape you know I could leave the commentary booth I'm sure Punk would love to have a few more matches if not a full-time run I mean he has the juices flowing that's why he does commentary for MMA it's because he can't get in there anymore but he wants it and loves it so he will stick around commentary and be as close to the cage as he can. Same with WWE. I'm sure he would love to come in and talk about it, whether he's working directly with Fox or with WWE involved in some way. You know, he's sitting there going, wow, well, I could have done that. Well, hey, I could do that match. Or, you know, whether it's arrogance or not, he would want to get in there and still prove that he is the best in the world. So developing story there on CM Punk, I think it's big news. And I think anybody that follows any of this, would know that it's big news, so we will wait on wait and see on that. I'm going to remind all of you that you are listening to the 411 Foresight Wrestling Podcast. You already know all of that. You're on the 411 Podcasting Network, so you can subscribe, like, review, give us five stars, all of that on iTunes. And up next, we're going to talk about another guy potentially returning. Truth be told, he um, is not somebody I've been a fan of. And I know he's had his supporters, but I I wrote about him uh, in 2010, 2011, when he kind of had a little bit of a main main event kind of run with WWE. Um, His name is John Morrison. Uh, Obviously, uh, everybody knows him with his last names and all the companies he's worked for since. But the new story is John Morrison may be returning to WWE. He left Impact a few weeks ago and kind of finished up there, did his stuff. And the story notes that, you know what, he's going to be, what, 38, 39 years old? And, you know, you can only do so much from there. And I I feel like a lot of guys, I mean, we've seen the names, but once you kind of leave Impact, I mean, once you kind of are done with that, you're, uh, you know, you're kind of done with it. Once you kind of go, you're done with it. And you're waiting on whether it's AEW or WWE. And he did have the Survivor appearance last year. I don't think it, like, really meant much or did anything for him. So I think people were kind of waiting for now Morrison to kind of break on and be this big star because of Survivor. Obviously, Impact thought he was going to be something bigger. They made him their champion and all that. I don't think it ever really, you know, materialized too much for him, unfortunately. But, you know, today is the exact uh, reason we're talking about CM Punk and now Morrison. Um, WWE is trying to sign people. And you can mention everything you want with uh, them hoarding talent and, you know, just stockpiling them and, you know, every other phrase you want to use. But here's the deal. They got three hours on Raw. They got a studio show it's called, like, The Bump or something. It's another one-hour you know, studio show, whatever you want to call it, that might be airing on the network. I think Wednesday mornings is being teased. And then from there, you have two hours now live NXT every Wednesday night on USA. Again, cable TV. And guess what? They're now going two hours Fox Fridays. They got two hours there live also Friday night. And that's not even counting NXT UK. And who knows what's going on with 205 Live. I don't think Morrison would go there. But again, All these different shows, all these different programs, all these different outlets, and I'm probably even forgetting a few actually in my head. You can't tell me the guy can't fit somewhere. Okay, so yeah, they're signing a bunch of people. They have been for about four or five years now, so this isn't anything new. So anybody trying to say this is an AEW connection, not true. They've been stockpiling and getting different talent for years now. We know all the signings. We could list everybody at the PC right now, the Performance Center and NXT. They've been signing a whole bunch of people. And John Morrison just may be the latest guy. Again, I'm not the biggest fan of him. I never have been. I'm going to take a quick real drink here, like Stone Cold says, a drink for the working man. Ah, that tastes good. So I think John Morrison can come back. He's obviously a uh, you know proven veteran at this point. Um, In a lot of ways, I compare him to Shelton Benjamin, where he kind of had his little run. I don't know if it's the ruthless aggression era or whatever you want to call it, but he kind of had his mid-card run. He won of different titles, you know, the Intercontinental. Did a different stuff with the tag division, and we already know about Mercury and Nitro, Molina. We also got Miz and Morrison. Can you imagine if those two team back up again? That would give Miz something to do, that's for sure. But otherwise, I think Morrison can just kind of be plugged in wherever. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. He's not going to main event. He's not coming back to main event WrestleMania. He's not coming back to, 
you know, headline shows across the country. He's not coming back for that. Anybody expecting that is, you know, probably, uh, you know, getting a little too feisty, a little too ahead of themselves with this. But can he come in and win the Intercontinental title? Can he come in and put on a 20-minute match with AJ Styles? Can he come in and, you know, do a million different other things? And his YouTube show with The Miz, that could come back. I think it was called The Dirt Sheets or something like that. I mean, they absolutely can. As much as I may not enjoy John Morrison as much as others, I'm not going to sit here and deny that he can't do stuff. So he absolutely can. And actually, in a lot of ways, I look forward to it. And not to make a prediction or anything, but I think he's somebody where you can air vignettes for. I think he's someone you can air promos for his return. Making a little shocking return or whatever. You know, I don't think that really makes much of a like a buzzworthy moment or anything, but you know, hyping up videos, you know, airing promos for the next few weeks and then saying a date for him to debut or return on, I think that would work. So once again, I'm going to take a little bit of a drink here. Tastes good. My throat is bugging me like nuts right here. I'm trying to get this done in about 45 minutes. I think we're at about 20 something right now. So that's my thoughts on John Morrison returning. I'm not, uh, head over heels over it or anything. I'm not going to jump for joy and cry over the return of Morrison and all of his amazing entrances and sunglasses and jackets and stuff. But no doubt he can be plugged in there in some way. So my final topic here, I'm not even sure how I'm going to talk about this again. I'm trying to get this done in about 40, 45 minutes here. So I'm about halfway through. But basically, we have a big week ahead of us, folks. Uh, regardless of your feelings on it coming up, it's a big week for everybody. I think everybody is well aware of that. I think it's hard to deny that at this point. And I think um, both companies kind of, um, you know, deserve a pat on the back. They recognize a few weeks or months ago that, hey, this is, you know, going to get interesting. And whether it's true or not, they needed to step up their game. They just did. And, you know, the same old, same old wasn't going to fly anymore. So I have to give at least them credit. And I have to give them props for stepping up to the plate. So I'm going to talk about first Monday Night Raw. This is being billed as the season premiere. That's kind of a joke, but, you know, I guess it's the season premiere. I don't know how it's the season premiere, but whatever. So right away, though, we got Seth Rollins against Mysterio for the Universal Championship. I don't think anyone in their right mind is expecting Mysterio to win this match, considering The Fiend is scheduled to face Seth Rollins inside the cell at the pay-per-view the following week. But, you know, there's nothing wrong with going out there with Rollins and Mysterio, giving them 20, 25 minutes and saying, hey, go out there and have a heck of a match and the crowd will love it. And then, you know, the Fiend can strike afterwards. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. I'm sure Dominic, Mysterio's son, will be watching. I don't think he's going to cost him the match or do anything ridiculous like people are trying to predict. I don't think any of that's going to happen. But, you know, Mysterio back kind of in the full. He had his little down in the dumps moments and, you know, teased retirement. But, Back on the winning track, and here he is, a main event little Seth Rollins on Raw. So I think it's going to be awesome. I love it, and that is the kind of match where you can kind of promote. And I think people will stick around for it, whether it's the opening match or the last match. I think people are going to watch this and care about it. Up next, we have Miz TV with Ric Flair and Hulk Hogan. Um, I have no clue what those two are going to do, <laughs> honestly. This feels almost like a video game plug where they're going to kind of come out and talk about the game. And then Miz, I'm sure, will have a feud with somebody. And, you know, something will break down from there. And, you know, maybe Hogan will throw a few punches. I'm not sure he can never take a bump again or fall down or anything like that. And, you know, Ric Flair is always good for a few chops. So I'm sure he will come in. They can do their little, you know, little action without really doing much. And then Miz can transform that into whatever feud is going on with him. So it'll be fun. It's interesting. It's just WWE again, using legends to promote something. And I'm not sure I agree with the tactic at this point, but whatever, if it draws eyeballs and gets people to care about Miz and his feud, then I guess the tactic works up next Brock Lesnar. And again, Brock Lesnar showing up. We will talk about him Friday night a little bit more for SmackDown, but Brock, I'm sure he'll just come out. Heyman will give a promo and talk about how in four or five days, whatever it comes to Friday night, he will become the new WWE champion on Fox. And, you know, Heyman will tell everyone to tune in. You're going to witness something special. Brock Lesnar wrestling on TV, which, you know, is super duper rare. I think it's been over a decade. I know they did a little thing with Rollins after WrestleMania 31, but I don't think that ever officially officially became a match 
So whether you love Brock Lesnar or not, it's going to be a historic moment for him Friday night against Kofi Kingston. Up next, we have AJ Styles against Cedric Alexander. Uh, the U.S. championship is on the line. There's been a lot of talk about Cedric, and I agree him losing two times in a row and losing decisively was not something I liked. I did not even you know think that the feud would continue. That seemed to be clear-cut done to me. But the fact that now he's gotten back one up over AJ and the story is still being told of, hey, Cedric ain't done here yet. He may have taken a loss and taken a bump or two, but, you know, he's coming back stronger than ever. So I don't know if we get the title change, but it is very interesting that, hey, Cedric Alexander ain't done, folks. And he's facing AJ Styles, Monday Night Raw, you know, in a big, you know, quote unquote, season premiere kind of type thing where they're actually billing this as something big. So whether he wins or loses, that's a big moment for him. I don't know how this fits into the sell pay-per-view because it's very weird how all these matches are happening before the pay-per-view. They, they do kind of have to spread this out a little bit. I understand it may be bad timing, but there's never bad timing when these shows and these channels are giving you a billion dollars each for your shows. So there's never a bad time for that. Um, and then the final thing listed here, Alexa Bliss versus Sasha Banks. <laughs> Um, I don't think we're going to go over the history with those two because, you know, there's just, if you know the backstory between them, but either way, it'll be a fun little match, I'm sure. And I don't expect Bliss to win. Sasha Banks is the one getting the championship match inside the cell against Becky Lynch. So I would assume she wins, but that's kind of a stacked little bit of a raw there. I, I like it. I, I plan on watching it live. I don't want to quote myself on it, but that is the plan right now. So we will see how that goes over on NXT. On USA, because yes, folks, we do not have a SmackDown on Tuesday night. Remember, going to Fridays. Um, Adam Cole versus Matt Riddle for the NXT Championship. I'm very, very surprised that that is not the next TakeOver main event, because that is what I was told you know, a few weeks ago, and actually before the last TakeOver, that those two were going to be headlining the next TakeOver. But they did the Johnny Gargano rematch once more, and then they were going to kind of go into this, so... I don't know. The, the show's build is no BS, and I, I kind of hope they go back to the no BS thing. I didn't like the street fight having a non-finish there first week. I didn't really like that. If you're going to do no BS, then you know what? Give us clean finishes. If the heels cheat, they cheat. Fine, whatever. That's what they do. But give us matches and give us finishes. So I don't think Riddle will win the championship. It feels like the Undisputed Era kind of need a little bit of a run with all the gold here, or else this what, lasted a week or two. I, I don't know if that would all be worth it then. But then again, if these two kind of break down into a brawl with no finish, I'm not sure that works either. So I'm very intrigued to see how this is. NXT will now be two hours. It'll be two hours live on USA, obviously, against Dynamite, which is premiering for AEW and TNT. So that's kind of the ploy there. But, you know, they got a bunch of championship matches here. So I will be interested to see how that one is because I have no idea. Speaking of having no idea, Shayna Baszler defends her women's NXT championship against Candice LeRae. Uh, she kind of came out of nowhere. She's been kind of building herself up a little bit, but she won the Fatal 4-Way, and now she gets the championship match. Um, if there is a title to change on this show, if there is a big headline, if there's a big moment, I think this is it. I think um, a lot of people have been predicting Baszler to lose the NXT Women's Championship for months now, and actually if you go back and look in all my columns, I have been picking her to retain every single month. I have not had her losing the championship at all. So that has not been a surprise to me. But in this moment, during this match, this I could see her losing. I think Candace has a lot of momentum. I know her thing with Io Shirai is not quite finished. So if she does lose, it would be thanks to her. But as long as these two get 15 minutes to just tear the house down, I think it'd be great. I don't think it would main event, but it also would not shock me if they say, hey, NXT is all about the women. Here's Baszler. Here's LeRae. Go out there 15 minutes. Have a great match, and we'll end it how we ended. I would love that. Speaking of titles, we got the tag team titles on the line. Street Profits versus the Undisputed Era, obviously, Bobby Fish and Kyle O'Reilly. Um, this, this, this feels like Street Profits' farewell to NXT. I don't necessarily agree with them being on both shows. It does feel like they're kind of doing nothing on Raw. And we've kind of seen it with the Mike and Maria connection and stuff. You know, let's be honest. They're doing nothing on Raw. 
the whole backstage promos and stuff like that, it's, it's kind of run its course. At some point, you got to get them in front of the live audience. They have to do something. So I'm going to pick them to lose, and I don't know if they're going to say farewell or stick around, but you know, I would hope they kind of go on from there. Johnny Gargano uh, versus Shane Thorne here. Um, Johnny Gargano is probably going to get a win and talk about his future. I, I think people are kind of waiting for Tommaso Ciampa to return. He's kind of said he's not ready, but of course, you know, that's Ciampa, and he's setting up the surprise. So if we get the big headline from NXT in a return, I would think it's Champa coming out, whether it's you know physical action or just coming out and pointing at him or whatever. Um, I think that'd be kind of cool. And then of course the Velveteen Dream experience. No idea what this is going to be, but he's apparently going to have a segment. So you know that'll be interesting. It's it's always the Velveteen Dream, and you know I think we're all fans of him. So uh, also on the same night we had the Total Divas premiere. We're not really going to talk about this, but you know I think it is cool that Ronda Rousey still connected with the company is. Um, you know, she joins the cast. Sonya Deville also will. But um, I think it's going to be most interesting to kind of follow Ronda Rousey. Obviously, this was taped months ago. So if you're looking for, you know, a new headline or something cool or a little insight on her potential return, I don't think you're going to get it. Um, this was obviously filmed months ago, and there's not a whole lot she could have revealed then. But still, just kind of cool that Ronda Rousey is hanging around. And, you know, whether she's pregnant or, or not yet, which she said she was getting to, but... Um, LA Friday night SmackDown again. Don't be shocked if she shows up there because the Friday night SmackDown premiere on Fox. This is it, folks. We've talked about it now for a year and a half. We've known about them moving to Fox. We've known about the billions of dollars. We know about the huge deal. We know about the promotion. We know about the football. We know about the baseball connections. We know about the FS1 studio show. We know all about it, but it's finally arrived. And you know, again, credit WWE, they've stacked this card up big time. Uh, the Blue Carpet SmackDown kickoff show. <laughs> I have no, de- no idea what that's going to be. That seems interesting. Obviously, celebrities and legends and current stars, whoever's going to be arriving, they're going to walk the blue carpet. This is like a cool little pre-show thing, a little kickoff thing where, you know, it hypes up the show. And then I'm sure there'll be a countdown clock somewhere in there. And I'm sure, you know, whoever is commentating is going to, you know, mention it's going to be, hey, the show starts on Fox at 7 o'clock. I know 7 o'clock Central Time for me, but 7 o'clock, you know, it, it's going to be happening. And I think that's kind of cool. It lets people get ready for it. Like, hey, here's all these people. They're going to run down the card, get it ready. It, it almost does feel like a pay-per-view. Now, is every week going to feel this big? Of course not. We already know that second week it'll kind of fall back down to earth a little bit. And then third week is where it kind of will settle into wherever it is on the ratings and viewership. But first week, I love the idea of a blue carpet special, obviously, to fit the SmackDown theme. And we got a few matches, too. Kevin Owens versus Shane McMahon. Loser leaves WWE ladder match. Uh, This kind of reminds me of the Matt Hardy Edge thing from uh, Raw 2005, the homecoming when they went back to USA. That kind of reminds me of what this is here. Obviously, not much to add to the storyline. We already know about it. Owens and McMahon have been going at it forever. Um, I thought it'd end up inside the cell, but I guess they already did their cell match, so that would kind of feel a little redundant. No no need to kind of do the rematch. I know Cena and Orton had two cell matches, but Owens and McMahon felt like it was building to that. Instead, they're building that up to kind of close this chapter, and I'm going to assume the chapter being closed is the Shane McMahon story. Um, I don't know how much Fox cares for the McMahons all over their TV. There's always reports that, you know, TV executives love the McMahon drama and everything. So that's why Vince McMahon always comes back if ratings are down or if they ever need a spark. It's always, hey, let's bring back the McMahons. So I don't know how Fox feels about that. But to me, um, I say this as a Shane McMahon fan, as somebody who actually enjoys his uh, stunt kind of matches and all of his different wild things that he does and the best in the world gimmick and all that. You know, I'm a fan of it, but it, it, it's been time. I think it was probably time when Undertaker came back and Roman Reigns teamed up. I think it was probably time then to end it. And certainly by SummerSlam when Owens, you know, beat Shane and stunned him in a million times and all that. But either way, loser leaves WWE. I'm going to assume Owens wins. And I'm going to assume Shane does some ridiculous flying off the ladder moment that... Fox can promote and show on their headline packages and you know everybody wins that way Shane can go back to doing what he's doing apparently he's been getting more of a voice backstage to you know help with the product and whether you love him or not on screen off screen the guys love him 
you know, I don't know what Kevin Owens is yapping about in his promos, but the locker room loves him. Shane has always been giving to people, always will offer some input, always kind of help with people. And there's a million stories out there of him just being a super, super cool guy. So I'm kind of excited to see what he can do after this. I don't think Shane will win. I know this, the speculation is Shane will once again find a way to win and then Owens will go to NXT. But I don't think so. I know Owens could fit in there at any spot. There's always a spot for a guy like Kevin Owens. But I would prefer not. He does feel like somebody that Fox would want on their show and obviously is a big fan favorite. So I would go with Owens winning there. And uh, we got the women spotlighted here. It's the four horse women in a tag match, which again leads me to believe Ronda Rousey may not be far behind, at least in the front row. So... Becky Lynch and Charlotte against Bailey and Sasha Banks. I believe we just saw this match about two weeks ago. I kind of wish they didn't do that match because then this match would mean a whole lot more. And it'd be like, hey, look at what they're doing for the premiere on Fox. But it's like, oh, they just kind of did this match. So it, it loses a little luster, but not too much. I think um, both feuds uh, with the singles women, obviously Charlotte and Bailey, and then Becky and Sasha. I think it's been fine. I don't um, I don't know if it still has its momentum from the last pay-per-view, Clash of the Champions, but it's fine right now. I don't know if Charlotte's a face or a heel or what they're doing with that. I have no earthly idea, and honestly, I don't even know if it matters too much. But either way, these four in a tag match, it's a perfect thing to promote all four of the ladies before the big draft the following week so we kind of figure out which show they're each going to go to and how the title's going to situate here. I've talked about this before, but... I don't see Rollins and Becky, you know, splitting up on the road. So does the Fiend win the championship? I would assume he doesn't lose. So would the Fiend win the championship from Rollins? And then that means what? Becky also loses, but then Sasha would be on Raw and Bray would be on Raw. But then that would also mean what? Rollins and Becky Lynch both go to SmackDown. Well, then what does Bailey do? Does she stay with her SmackDown Women's Championship? Does Flair stay there? Does Sasha, the only one of the four horsemen women, to stay on Raw while the other three are on SmackDown? I would assume Becky Lynch and Ronda Rousey, If again, if they ever get back to that. I assume Fox would want that to promote Rousey. So that would tell me Becky would be on SmackDown. And then Rousey can have the Fox connection. Obviously, MMA, UFC. And then... You know, she can return and they can build up to that one on one match we haven't gotten yet. But again, this all kind of hinges on Rousey and her pregnancy. We have no idea what's going on with that. So I'm just kind of spitballing here. But either way, these four out there, you know, it's going to be a great match, I'm sure. Finish, I don't think really matters too much. Again, it's just getting these four out there for the Fox audience. And yet, there is something bigger, folks. The main event, I would build this up all night. I would have a countdown clock. I would hype this thing up the wazoo. Uh, Kofi Kingston defends his championship against Brock Lesnar. Um, oh boy. I, I mean, I get all the arguments for Kofi. I get it, but the title reign has not been good. He, he talked last week on SmackDown about facing Ziggler and Owens and Orton, and I can't even remember who else he named, but you know, all good to solid matches, but I talked about it every pay-per-view. The crowd just really did not care. I think two of them, they were chanting, we want Lesnar. With Orton every week, it seemed they were chanting uh, RKO, and I think when he even gave an RKO to him, I believe they chanted one more time. That is not something a crowd should be chanting towards a beloved baby face like Kofi Kingston, especially a guy, Orton, who's basically called him stupid, and the crowd is chanting one more time after an RKO. That doesn't sound good to me. I think Fox, and we've talked about this for months. Again, if you haven't been listening to this podcast, we've been talking about it for months. You know Fox wants Brock Lesnar. He finished up with Raw. I actually thought he finished up on Raw after Mania. He was done. He lost the title to Rollins. That was the story. He did it again at SummerSlam to kind of bring it full circle especially. But I think he's done with Raw, the Universal Championship. It feels kind of done and over with. Now it's time to go conquer a new brand, his old brand in a lot of ways, SmackDown. WWE Championship, he's advertised for a few SmackDown shows. I think that's kind of clear by now. He's going to be Friday nights on Fox, and, you know, if it's up to me, he takes the title. I mean, Kofi, the ride was great. WrestleMania was awesome, arguably one of the matches of the year, arguably one of the moments of the year. But, you know, everything kind of keeps going. You know, it's a continuous thing. The, the wheel keeps moving, as they say. You take off one gear and you put in a new gear, and the wheel will keep moving. And the new gear, I think, right now is Brock Lesnar for Fox. That's what they want. 
And if Kofi gets it back or this ends in a DQ or whatever, fine, I get it. But, you know, Kofi's not beating Brock on SmackDown. We all know that. And I think instead of having some BS finish, again, back to the NXT thing, you got to deliver a finish. And the finish is Brock Lesnar just decimating Kofi. That's what I would do. I would have him stand tall, the Fox thing, whatever. I'm sure there'll be surprised people. I've talked about it before. The Rock, LA, I think Stone Cold, and a million other people, Trish Stratus. Uh, just a long list of people will be in the house that night. I think it's going to be a great event. But please keep in mind that this is the premiere. Obviously, they're going all out for the premiere. What they do after this is going to be much different. It's just they're hyping up this one show. They want to pop a big rating and then keep that number going forward. So it'll be very interesting. Fox isn't paying a billion dollars for SmackDown to underperform each week. They're just not doing that. So, I mean, you have to bust out all the moves, all the big names, everything possible. They have to bust it out and do everything imaginable. And I think Brock Lesnar's that guy. But, folks, there is one other show next week. And it's finally time. It's finally time for AEW on TNT. Wednesday nights, again, Dynamite. I'm not a big fan of the name. I know Tuesday night Dynamite or whatever had been trademarked for months, but obviously they couldn't go to Tuesday nights because NBA on TNT is a much, much, much higher probability and a huge, huge promotion for TNT. And they can't, you know, move that for AEW. I'm sorry, they can't. So they ended up going with Wednesday nights. Dynamite, eh, doesn't, you know, eh. Doesn't jump off at the page to me, but again, TNT, Dynamite, yeah, you get it, you know, whatever. So we already know the opening match. Um, Cody, Cody Rhodes, whatever you want to call him, is going to be facing Sammy. I can't pronounce his last name. Sammy Guevara, I believe, something like that. I believe they've already said this is not only going to kick off the show, but, you know, it's going to start right away. They want to make it very clear this is all elite wrestling, and we have our matches here. Kind of like NXT with the no BS thing. Like, you want solid in-ring action? We're starting right with the match. So, Cody versus Sammy. Cody's kind of positioned himself as the kind of front man for AEW and the big hero and all that stuff. And, of course, he's getting the title match against Jericho in November. I, I can't imagine anything other than Cody winning and then probably giving a speech afterwards. Probably, you know, thanking everybody for, you know, AEW and TNT. And, you know, I, I would hope he doesn't take any more shots. I think... I think we're kind of done with the AEW guys taking shots on Twitter against the NXT guys and the, the industry in itself. You know, it's it's very tiring at this point. I mentioned it with the Kenny Omega stuff. You know, it's not helping the company. It's not. They, they may think they're rallying their fans or anything. It's not doing that at all. And whether they want to say they're in character or not doesn't matter. They did the same thing now with the UK TV deal, which is not very good considering what they were hyping and Cody saying how it's much better than WWE's and just talking about how amazing it was. And then it's announced and it's nothing. So, you know, nothing to write home about, at least. Obviously, it's something, but not anything close to what they were hyping up. So they kind of got to cool it with the hype here. I, I would assume Cody wins here, and I hope he gives a speech, but... Lay off the little WWE shots. N- nothing too much there. AEW Women's Championship. Nyla Rose versus uh, Rio. Rio, again, I don't know how to pronounce her name. I've only seen limited action to some of these people. But um, I think Nyla Rose seems to be the pick here. I'm not going to argue against either one because, again, I don't really know either one. But I think Nyla Rose here kind of fits with what they've been doing. If she's going to win the big battle royal... I mean, she's not going to now come here and lose. If you're going to spend that much energy in it, they already did Hangman Page, and that was kind of a dud there. So if she's going to win the Battle Royal, it's kind of like the Royal Rumble. If you're going to invest that much into someone, you kind of got to pay it off. At least that's my mind. So you got to kind of give her then the victory. And I would give her the you know inaugural Women's Championship. Why not? Let's see how that goes. Up next, uh, Kenny Omega and the Young Bucks versus Jericho and two mystery partners. Um... All along, if you've been listening to this podcast, LAX was going to AEW. That's been the story all along, and they are now in AEW, whatever their actual names are, and I thought they would debut here. They actually debuted at the pay-per-view a few weeks ago, so, I mean, I'm led to believe then they won't be the mystery partners, but a lot of people think they will be. So either way, I think this is, again, just kind of like the four horse women. I think this is just a six-person tag to just kind of get everybody out there, have a match. I don't think the finish ultimately matters. MJF is going to face Brandon Cutler. Uh, MJF seems to be building his own little story with Cody. If he's going to turn on him, he's being buddy, whatever you want to call it. I, I'm picking MJF here. And then uh, Hangman Page versus Pac, Pac, however you want to pronounce it. Um, I think uh, I think this is the match where uh, John Moxley comes out. I think uh, 
uh, he may be cleared by now. I think that might be the big thing for TNT is to, you know, announce uh, the match and then everything's going, blah, blah, blah. And then, hey, folks, John Moxley's also here. We already knew that, but for the TNT audience, it's going to be a big moment for all of them. So I think it's going to be cool. Um, I know a lot of people don't want to talk about the ratings. Uh, NXT is over a million each week now. Uh, with a stack card and a big lineup, I would want to say that they will retain that million, but I don't know if they actually will. It'll be interesting now because obviously they're two hours, and also now with the AEW competition on TNT, it's going to be interesting. Uh, I said a few months ago AEW is going to get three million for its debut. You can cross that off, folks. I was speaking like an idiot. They're not getting 3 million viewers. I would guess around a million and then kind of there like NXT. Then you kind of hover around and figure out where they're going. So either way, it's going to be eventful. It's going to be exciting stuff. I'm excited to see how it goes. I hope both shows kind of don't take pot shots, but whatever. So I got 20 seconds to hit my 45-minute mark. So I'm just going to remind you all that listen to the 4114 Site Wrestling Podcast, 411 Podcasting Network, Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube, Google Play, and of course, 411mania.com. I thank all of you for listening, and please, please, please try to enjoy the next week of wrestling.